In this video, we're going to cover NES emulation on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. So not a whole lot has really changed since my last NES video for Xbox Series X and S, but I've noticed that the Messen Core isn't running as smoothly for me as I'd like, so I started going back to the Nestopia Undead Edition Core, and the performance there is just a little bit smoother, and I'm really enjoying it. So I thought I'd just do a quick little update for this video. Let's dive in. Now before we get started, this video is a continuation of my how to install RetroArch guide. So refer back to this guide if you need to get that set up. But moving on. So our one and only prerequisite for NES emulation is to source some NES games. There are a number of ways to get these these days. If you have an NES Classic, anything on a virtual console on a hacked Wii or Wii U, you can dump those ROM files directly. If you have a physical collection of NES games, you can use a hardware dumper to dump those. I recently used a Retron 5 to dump my NES collection. That was really funny. Or, as always, you can resort to the shady parts of the net to get them. I really don't care which way you do it, but don't ask me for illegal download links, because, as always, I will not be giving them out. But once you have your NES games sourced, all we need to do is add them to our Xbox. If you have a USB drive that you've been using on Xbox, you just need to open it up and drag your NES games in. But once those are placed, we're ready to begin playing. So over on the Xbox, just get booted into RetroArch. And now from here, we can go to load content and begin loading up our NES games. So if you put them on USB, you just need to take your USB drive out of your computer and put it into the Xbox. And then when you go to load content, you should have an E drive. You can click on this, go into NES games, select a game, tell it which core to run on and start playing. Or if you put them on the S drive, which is the development files file share, you go down to S, program files, windows apps, RetroArch folder, your games folder, NES games, and there you go. What I personally prefer to do instead of using that method though, is to actually make a games playlist. And the easiest way to do so is to go down to import content. And I like to do a manual scan, content directory. I'm gonna be using my USB drive for my NES games. So for that, I'm gonna go down to E, select my NES games folder, scan this directory. If you wanted to do the S drive, you would just select the S drive, program files, Windows apps, RetroArch folder, games folder, NES games, and then scan that directory. But now system name, we are going to press A on this, press right on your D-pad to go down to Nintendo, and find Nintendo Entertainment System. If for whatever reason you don't get a nice little screen like this, you need to download the core info files and update the assets and just update all that stuff in the online updater. Default core, press right on your D-pad to go down to Nintendo. And for this video, like I said, I'm going to be using Nestopia Undead Edition. Messen and Nestopia are the two most accurate NES cores available, but like I said, Messen seems to just have the slight hitch for me, and I'm not sure what that's about. It might not happen for everyone, but for me it's definitely been happening, so I'm currently using Nestopia again. Now make sure Scan Recursively is on if you have your games separated into subfolders. And if you have your games compressed in zip format or something like that, make sure Scan Inside Archives is turned on. And now go ahead and start the scan. And once that scan has finished, you will have a new Nintendo Entertainment System playlist here on the left. And then you could just start up a game by going into it and pressing A and telling it to run. And there we go, NES games up and running on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. Nice and easy. So for those of you looking to get NES games up and running on your Xbox, that's pretty much all there really is to it. They're going to look great, run great, and just be ready for you to play NES games with. Like, it's awesome. But let's go ahead and talk about some of the more advanced core options here. So going into your RetroArch quick menu, you can scroll down to options. And our first option is a Blarg NTSC filter. Now this filter is awesome, it mimics the output of different video signals. So you have a bunch of different options available from composite video, S-video, RGB SCART to plain old monochrome black and white. So if you like the emulated sharp pixel look, you'll want to leave this off. But if you want to mimic some of the video output types, like I have an RGB modded top loader NES, so the RGB look is something I really like and am used to. Like, it's pretty fantastic. 
And then of course you could go straight back down to composite, just getting all of the uh, composite video artifacts that are associated with it. It's a pretty authentic look and one a lot of people would probably enjoy. So this option is totally personal preference, so set this to what you like. If you want it to be the sharpest possible, leave it off. But if you want it to be more representative of an NES video signal, you can choose one of these. I like setting mine to RGB SCART personally, just because it looks like my top loader. Next up, we have Color Palette, and this is set to the Sony CXA 2025AS by default on Nestopia. This is actually my favorite color palette personally. NES games were weird in the fact that the system itself doesn't actually have a set color palette. Output would look different depending on a user's TV. It was pretty crazy times. So there's a number of different options available, so you can just go ahead and scroll between them and see which ones you like. For some more authentic experiences with NES color palettes, definitely recommend going the Firebrand X route with any of these ones. No wrong choice, honestly. Like, it's all personal preference. Next, we have the Remove Sprite Limit option. So when there were more than eight sprites on a hardware line, you would get flickering. I'm sure those of you familiar with NES know very well what I'm talking about. So you could turn Remove Sprite Limit on to try to get rid of or reduce the flickering. Next up, we have a CPU Speed Overclock, and this is to help remove hardware-based lag from NES titles. So numerous games would start to lag the NES hardware, so you can actually increase the emulated CPU speed to overcome this. You can double it here. It's kind of interesting to see these games running without their hardware lag, but at the same time, it kind of removes the authenticity to me, so I don't use it, but I know a number of you out there will absolutely love this option. Next up is the four-player adapter. So there were some games that used a four-player adapter for four-player multiplayer on the NES. This option is set to auto by default, and it should work in most cases, but sometimes you will need to set the option manually between NTSC and Famicom. Next, we have a Famicom Disk System option. I am not covering Famicom Disk System stuff because I do not own one. I don't have the BIOS files for one or any games to really show how to use it. But leave this option on if you use Famicom Disk System. It automatically reloads your game, so it's a good option to leave on. Next, we have a couple of overscan options. We can mask the vertical overscan, which is on by default. And then we can also mask the horizontal overscan. So this is good for games like Super Mario Bros. 3 that has that weird look to the side of it. You know what I mean. Next up, we have preferred aspect ratio. This is set to auto by default, but I like to manually set it to 4x3 because games were meant to be stretched to 4x3 by your display. That's just how the systems worked. But you can also choose between NTSC and PAL here, but I just like using 4x3 personally. Next up, we have Game Genie sound distortion. So if you used Game Genie a lot back when you were a kid, you are probably used to the way the audio sounded as it was being passed through the Game Genie. You can mimic that with this option. Next up we have System Region, and this is set to auto by default and should work for most things. If it doesn't work for a particular homebrew or anything like that, you can manually set a region here. Next we have RAM Power On State, and this is not really going to be that useful for most users, but if you want to mess around with different uh, glitches that would appear in certain ROMs, you can set a RAM address between these three different options. Next we have shift buttons clockwise, so by default on an Xbox controller, the B button is your A button on an NES controller, and your A button is the B button on an NES controller. By turning this option on, it shifts A to A, and your X button then becomes the NES's B button. It's a little more ergonomic, so use it as you see fit. Next up we have Arkanoid device and Zapper device. We can ignore these because we can't use either in the Xbox version of RetroArch, so it doesn't really matter. Same with Show Crosshair, we don't need that. Next we have the Turbo Pulse Speed, so by default the X and Y button mimic the A and B button, but in turbo mode. So you can set the uh, frequency at which they activate here. And our last option is um, a bunch of audio things. I don't think I'm going to bother covering these today, but if you want to look at them, you can press A on this, leave the options menu, come back in and you get a bunch of different audio channel options and things like this. Again, most end users aren't gonna need this, so I'm really not gonna go over it. But that's gonna do it as far as NES core options are concerned. If there's anything you need to save on a per game basis, you could go up to manage core options and save them as a game options file. So an example of this, if you wanna have different color palettes on different games, pretty handy. 
But that's going to do it as far as NES emulation on the Xbox Series X and S is concerned. Again, a pretty straightforward core to get set up, get you into gameplay really quickly, and honestly, who doesn't love getting into your games quick? As always, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to ask me down in the comment section below, and I will do my best to try to help you out. But now, if you could all do me just the hugest of favors, please be sure to hit that like or dislike button, just depending on how much you like today's tutorial. And if you haven't done so already, please be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can see when new videos like this go live on the channel. It goes a long way to helping us keep this place going, and we are super grateful to all of you for that. We're so close to hitting all of our goals, thanks to all of you, and we just cannot thank you all enough. If you'd like to further help support the channel, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little goes a long way to keeping this place up and running, and we're just so grateful to all of our current champions who have done so. Y'all are friggin' rock stars. Thank you for believing what we do. But that's gonna do it for this one, so until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, and we will see you all back next video.